I will begin uh, with the reminders, of course, yeah, and put some notes on the on the blackboard because we will make use of the results we established during the previous lectures. The beginning, yeah, with uh, Young's experiment, yeah, two holes, and we are looking at the source of light, yeah, in a quasi-monochromatic light, yeah, and we saw that in the observer plane, yeah. The intensity distribution, well, as long as the two holes at the same dimensions, of course, yeah, was given by that expression. So what we see is just the alternance yeah, of the bright and dark fringes, yeah, with a, const a contrast defined by this qu quantity, yeah, which is uh, you remember the complex degree of a mutual coherence, yeah and which is in fact the visibility of the fringes yeah and the visibility you remember were, was defined as a i max minus i min divided by i max plus i min now well, well in the context of the experiments that you will you will be <coughs> performing yeah? it would be also interesting yeah to be capable of establishing the same expression in case the two apertures yeah if not exactly the same dimension, yeah. So maybe one is a bit larger than the other one, yeah. So it means that here you will see uh, I1 plus I2 plus etc. Yeah. Okay. So you never know when we make the experiment. Maybe we will we, we'll find out that wow, we are not quite satisfied, and it could be due to the fact that the two small apertures yeah, don't have exactly the same size. So we have to take that into account. Yeah. So how to modify yeah, that formula very slightly? Yeah to account for that effect, yeah? So this is an example of contribution, yeah, that you could bring. After, so we saw that the complex degree of mutual coherence, yeah, was something uh, measuring the coherence between the electric field and yeah, the two holes, yeah? And was given by that expression. Okay, the visibility, yeah, I just mentioned the expression. Okay, then later on, yeah, we, we saw the following, that this uh, complex quantity, yeah, is in fact, does correspond in fact to some information from the source we are observing, yeah, and it is just a Fourier transform of the normalized intensity distribution of the source, yeah, as a function of the angle. And then we have seen that, well, by taking the inverse Fourier transform, yeah, well, it would be in principle possible yeah, to reconstruct yeah, the source intensity distribution just from measurements yeah, of uh, visibilities for different baselines, different orientations. And if we get a sufficient number of information in the UV plane, well, we can perform that integration and retrieve yeah, where the source structure with an angular resolution given yeah, by the longer baseline, yeah, divided by the wavelengths, yeah. So this is the principle of a uh, aperture synthesis. Okay, then during uh, an, an ex another lecture, what, what, what we have shown is that for a converging optical system, the distribution of the complex amplitude <laughs> in the focal plane is given also by the Fourier transform of the distribution of complex amplitude in the pupil plane, yeah? Okay? So this was represented in that form, yeah? And you see, uh, <coughs> in order that it is a real Fourier transform, you, you have to make a change of variables, yeah, given here, otherwise it would not be. Now, if I assume, yeah? If I assume that the the function, yeah, the pupil function, yeah, is represented by, I would say, pxy, which is equal to one or equal to zero, yeah, depending on whether I'm in the pupil plane or outside, yeah. Well, this expression, yeah, last time I have rewritten it like this, so. A of PQ is now called name H, H of PQ, and it's equal then to the Fourier transform yeah, of not big A, but P, 
xy like that, which depends on the variables pq. Yeah? So p equal x prime divided by lambda f, q y prime divided by lambda f. Lambda is a wavelength because this is for monochromatic light or quasi monochromatic. f is a focal length of the converging system. And x prime, y prime are card well, Cartesian coordinates yeah, in the focal plane. <coughs> okay. So, this is the way uh, you, you may read uh, the theorem, yeah, fundamental theorem. Distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane is given by the Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the entrance pupil. After we have applied yeah, this theorem yeah, to the case of a pupil which is square, so it's a square pupil, a square mirror, but converging, yeah, converging. And uh, well, we have applied uh, this theorem. And what I didn't say, but I just remind you, is that now the intensity distribution in the, fo in the focal plane, yeah? so the intensity distribution in the focal plane, yeah? is just the square of the modulus yeah, of the amplitude, complex amplitude distribution, yeah, okay? And so we, we have found, yeah, for the case of a square aperture, uh, which dimension is A by A, yeah, that uh, this quantity is equal to, so it's A square, square, so it's the square of the area of the pupil, multiply by sine pi p a divided by pi p a square times the sine pi q a divided by pi q a square. You remember? This is what we found, yeah? And then, well, we have discussed yeah, this application. So you, you see what, what we have done. Yeah, we have indeed taken yeah, the square of the module of the Fourier transform to go from here to there. Indeed, if I take the square of this quantity, which is this, it's really the square of the Fourier transform. And this is what I obtain. Yeah. So then we have seen that, <coughs> in fact, yeah, this is a impulse response yeah, of your telescope when you observe a point-like star. Yeah? And what we see, well, what we would like yeah, is that this response function to be as narrow as possible, yeah? because then it gives us a good angular resolution. Yeah? And to get a good angular resolution, either we, we work at very short wavelengths, which is better, yeah? or we use a big aperture, yeah? so a big size for the square. Okay, then came a second application, a circular aperture, yeah, Cir circular aperture, yeah. Then what, we, what we, we, we found for that case, yeah, is that the intensity distribution in the focal plane, yeah, well, it's still uh, given by that function. So we have to make the Fourier transform, yeah, of a circular aperture, yeah. And then what we were getting, yeah, with the following, we are getting that it's a pi r square. It's a power two, like that. So you see, it's a surface of the pupil, yeah, squared. And now, instead of having uh, the sine cardinals or the cardinal signs, what we were getting is the following: it's a two times the first order Bessel function uh, now I would say z divided by z like this so I take this square so you see that this quantity has been replaced by that one where the variable z is equal to 2 pi r is the radius of the aperture Rho prime yeah, is the uh, angular distance at which I look the value, what is the value of the PSF, and I divide by lambda f. 
So this is the airy disk function. I see that it is also proportional yeah, to the wavelength, inversely proportional to the radius or to the diameter of the aperture. And so well bigger is the aperture, yeah, better it is. And here is a is a view, a typical view of the airy disk. Yeah? Okay, then last time, yeah, during the, the, the last lecture, what, what we did, we say, oh, we know that uh, well, the visibility when you observe yeah, with uh, an interferometer made of two telescopes yeah, of uh, source is given by the Fourier transform yeah, of the intensity distribution of the source, normalized. Yeah. Then we say, well, but if it's circular, it's just exactly the same problem as here. Yeah. So let's try to find out yeah, what is the expression of the visibility. Yeah, and we found that expression. Yeah, you remember, by analogy, yeah? Okay? Okay, let's go. Okay, but th this was a, an important result. So maybe I also uh, just indicate it here, that the visibility of the fringes, yeah? For the case of a circular, circular source disk, yeah? Is two times the first order Bessel function multiply by pi, theta ud is a <coughs> angular diameter yeah, of the uniform disk, times b, which is a baseline, divided by the wavelength. And this I divide by the same quantity. OK. So this is good. And you remember, yeah? What we found, yeah, is that the zero order Bessel, yeah, was ge getting to a zero value when it is equal to 3.9, which translates, yeah, in a special frequency. Special frequency is a B over lambda, yeah, equal to 1.22. So when it is 1.22, yeah, it, go, it goes to zero. And so we said, well, when we make the, in the laboratory's experiment, yeah, with a milli interferometer, yeah, well, we try, yeah, to select the baselines, yeah, so that the visibility will be exactly equal to zero, yeah. Then try to find a baseline located here somewhere, and then maybe find a baseline located here, yeah. And then, well, if we have three points, yeah, well, you may uh, fit easily yeah, a nice curve, and then deduce the value, yeah, of the angular diameter of the source that we will be observing in the corridor, yeah. So this is the idea of the experiment. OK. Well, last time what we did, yeah, one more demonstration, yeah. We, we decided, yeah, to evaluate, yeah, what is the response function of an interferometer made of uh, two apertures, yeah, which are square. Or they could also be circular, yeah, but we just took that case. Yeah? And what we found, so it comes on the next slide, is that <coughs> the solution we found yeah, is the following. I will just uh, put it on the blackboard here. So the intensity distribution yeah, in the focal plane yeah, is equal to, OK, so it was. In fact, it was 2 d square. It's a power 2. So this is uh, the total area of the two pupil, of the, of the two square pupil. Do you agree? Yeah? The size of a square was d. So the, the area of one square is d square. The size of two, two aperture is 2 d square. It's a power 2, just, just like over there. Yeah? Then multiplied by we had a sine pi qd divided by pi qd square after times sine pi qp divided by pi qp square and still multiply by the square of pi p d, where d 
his baseline is the distance between the two square apertures. Yeah? And this was given uh, while providing the modulation, yeah? the point spread function at very high frequency. Okay. So you, you see, these are just a reminders yeah, of what we've done. Yeah? After we've seen the convolution theorem, yeah? well, namely that for the case of an extended source, yeah? which uh, surface brightness is re represented by this function, the distribution of brightness in the focal plane here is given by this, the convolution of this function by the response function yeah, of your interferometer. Yeah. Okay, now if it is made yeah, by uh, a two square aperture, what we have seen yeah, is that we could uh, represent EPQ by the product of EP times EQ. Now, if the source is symmetric, yeah, okay, I may also write that okay, OPQ yeah, is equal to is equal to OP times OQ. Well, we, we particularize this to the case of a square star. You remember a star which had an angular dimension of phi by phi, yeah? Okay, and now, well, what, what, what we could write then, so we know that EPQ is a convolution product, yeah? of one, of this one by HPQ square, like that. Uh, now, I may also write uh, that HPQ square is equal to HP square times HQ square, where HP square Is equal, so I'm just coming here. So th this is also equal to IPQ, yeah? So this, these are the same, yeah? So HP would be a 2D square multiplied by this quantity, sine square times that one. And the other one, HQ square, would be equal to the rest, yeah? So 2D square times sine PQD over PQD square. So it's a lot of uh, reminders, yeah? Okay, this I just pass, it will come back later. Yeah, this was the application we did, yeah, of that theorem, yeah, for a star which had a square, a square morphology, yeah, represented by this function, yeah. And what, what we found out at the end, yeah, is that if the square is a star, yeah, has an angular size which is too small, yeah, well, we will recover the impulse response of the interferometer because we will not resolve it. It's just as if it was a point star. But if its diameter phi was equal yeah, to lambda over d, yeah, so exactly equal to the resolution of our interferometer, yeah, then we would see no fringes. Yeah? So we demonstrated this last time. Yeah? OK. So now, what we shall do, yeah? I, we sh I shall just demonstrate now, today, the following. That uh, when we observe an object which is symmetric, so I make here an assumption, so the object is symmetric, yeah? With an interferometer composed of two aperture with Finite size, finite, finite size, yeah. So with a, not pinholes, yeah, but real sizes, yeah. I will, f we will find that the visibility of the fringes 
is still equal to the Fourier transform yeah, of the normalized intensity of the object. So we will just demonstrate now rigorously yeah, what we, we already demonstrated for the case of two pinholes. Yeah. And how to do that? Yeah? Well, what is of interest to us yeah, is essentially what is going on along the p direction, yeah? because the two square apertures are located there, yeah? the two apertures. Yeah? So along the, the other dimension, uh, other direction, yeah? I'm not going to resolve anything, yeah? just along the p direction. Yeah? So OK, so I'm just writing here. OK, so then I, I may write that EP is equal to the convolution of OP by HP square, like that. Yeah? OK? Now the HP square, yeah? I take a different color. The HP square comes from here. And I may rewrite yeah, this as follows. Well, I just say, well, it will be equal to 2d square then you, you will say, well, well, I will just write this, this term, yeah, I just take outside the convolution product and I will tell you why I can do that, pd square. So this is, in fact, yeah, something related to the response function yeah, of a single square, which is a size d. Yeah? And last time we've seen yeah, that if the, if the angular resolution yeah, of a single aperture, square aperture, yeah, was not good enough, yeah, well, I could not resolve the object. Yeah? I could not resolve the object. Yeah? So this object, yeah, well, <coughs> it's just like a, Dirac function yeah, for this convolution. And therefore, it can be taken outside. Yeah? Well, maybe I just come back one uh, slide before. So it's something we demonstrated last time. Yeah? It was this result. Yeah? And we said, well, this we could take yeah, outside the convolution yeah, because yeah, uh, <coughs> S simply because a single aperture yeah, cannot resolve a pond-like object, yeah? so there is no convolution at all. When I'm convolving yeah, a direct function with a p pi d over, so here it's small d, p pi d, so this is square 2, I know that the convolution of this by that, yeah, yeah, is simply equal to sine square of p pi d divided by p pi d square. Now, if you are not convinced, yeah, uh, we may just make it very explicitly. I say, okay, well, well, what is that? What is the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity? Yeah. Uh, now, I should say of delta p minus r yeah, times the sine square of pi rd over pi rd square dr. You agree? This is a convolution product. yeah. And this I know, well, is just equal to this function when p equal, when r equal p. Yeah? So I'm getting that result. Yeah? So uh, I see that if my single aperture, because this is a yeah, the response function of a single aperture, yeah, is not sufficient angular resolu resolution, yeah, it will never, uh, <coughs> it, well, the convolution yeah, of the object by this, this function will just be equal to the response function. And this, is, this was the reason why we, we could take this away from the convolution product. Yeah? So today I'm not going to repeat that, yeah? but I'm just going to assume that you are convinced that I can take this outside yeah, the convolution product. Yeah? So it's here. 
And then well, what remains is, of course, the convolution of OP by the cos square of P by D. Now, if I would ask you, let's assume this is really uh, the response function of the interferometer, yeah? Uh, due to the fact that we have two square apertures separated by a baseline D, yeah? Let's assume that it, it cannot resolve, yeah, the object, yeah? So it's, it sees it as a direct function, yeah? So it's just like a point-like function. Well, I would again, yeah, make the convolution product of these two, and I would say, well, it's just equal to that. Yeah? And then what, what I would find is that uh, well, the distribution of the flux in the focal plane, yeah? well, it's just uh, the response function of my interferometer because it is as if I was observing a point-like star. Yeah? But here I assume that, well, I have a baseline which is good enough for me to resolve yeah, the object. So I don't, I don't consider yeah, that this is equal to that. Yeah? So I'm going to make the convolution product. Yeah? Okay, so I'm only considering yeah, the term in bracket. Yeah? And after, I shall just uh, add the other factor. So the convolution product of OP by cos square of P by D is equal to, you agree that cos square P by D is equal to 1, so this is equal to 1 plus cosinus 2 pi pd divided by 2. Yeah? So when I do that, yeah, I find that it will be equal to the integration of OP dp plus integration, so from minus infinity plus infinity, yeah, plus infinity of Here I would write OP, so it's OR. Time the cosine of two by P minus R DR. And I should divide all of that by two. Correct? Okay, well, this is uh, nothing else than the, I would say, integration of the flux of the object yeah, along one direction. Yeah? But now uh, I, should, I should remember that to get the complete flux of the object, I should also integrate along Q. Yeah? So this one, if E is the total flux of the object, it means that E is equal to the double integration of OP, Q, DP, DQ. Yeah? If this is that, then I may write that the square root of E, yeah? the square root of E is equal to the integration of OPDP. Yeah? So okay, I can say okay, this is equal to one half. Well, I may rewrite OPDP like this, multiply by one plus the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity, then I should write O of R divided yeah, by the integration of OPDP. And now here I can say, well, I said this is symmetric, yeah, this is symmetric. I I assume that it is symmetric, so O of minus R is equal O of plus R, plus R, yeah. So I know that uh, I may say here the, I take the real part yeah, of the imaginary exponentiation of i two pi p minus r like that, and then dr. Why? Because this is this is symmetric, yeah. So <coughs> this is real. So if I take the real part of that, yeah, I know that uh, it's going to give me the cosine, okay? Yeah? Okay. 
Now, I define the normalized yeah, intensity distribution, the normalized intensity distribution as being OR divided by the integration of OPDP. Yeah. So here I see that this would be a normalized quantity. And so I may rewrite this that it is equal to one half this quantity, which is the square root yeah, of the total flux of the object, multiplied by one plus. OK, now I see that here I have uh, an imaginary exponentiation, which can be expressed as a product of two exponentiation. One, oh, here I forgot something, yeah? Uh, wait a moment. The d, uh, the d here, should appear here. So the d should be here, like that. So I may say, well, okay, it's the real part, yeah, of what? Of uh, e i two pi p d, which I take away from the integration, yeah multiply by the integration from infinity when infinity plus infinity of O prime of R time E minus I two P R D DR. Now because the O prime R yeah, is symmetric, yeah this Fourier transform, this is a Fourier transform, yeah, is a real. Yeah? It's real, yeah? If it was not symmetric, yeah, it would not be real. But since it's real, when I take the real part of all that, yeah, it means that it's equal to one half square root of E times one plus the cosine of two pi PD multiplied by the Fourier transform of O prime, which is a normalized intensity, yeah, or for the value V. So I repeat. Huh? So when I had this expression, I could write that this is the real part yeah, of this imaginary representation, of course. This is a double product of a complex exponential. So I distribute them. And now I have to take the real part of all of that, yeah? But since the function is, here is a real function, a uh, symmetric function, I know that this is a real quantity, yeah? Therefore, when I take the real part, yeah, I just have to take, yeah, only the real part of, the, of this uh, imaginary exponent which is cosine 2 pi pi. Okay. Now finally I may write, yeah? so this is uh, E of P. Yeah? yeah. So I may write now that E PQ is equal to what? Yeah. Well, it's equal to EP, so it's 2 D square times sine square P by D divided by P by D square, like this, multiplied by the result I have just established now. So <coughs> here I have uh, one half the square root of E multiplied by one plus the cosine of 2 pi pd times the Fourier transform of the normalized distribution of intensity of the object is observed with my interferometer which baseline is d. And now I have to multiply by eq. eq. And what, what is eq? Uh, eq. So eq uh, will be 
In fact, the square root yeah, of the other flux, since I go on the other direction, yeah, and then just multiply by the sine square of P pi Q, uh, P Q D, divided by P Q D square. Yeah? And multiply by this. So just to, to explain uh, rapidly why I added that quantity. Uh, is, this is very simple. Yeah? So I just write that EQ is equal to OQ convolved yeah, with the HQ square. Agree? Now, OQ is square root of E times the direct function because it's not resolved yeah, along the other direction. And now I have to convolve it yeah, with what? The HQ square, which is here, which was 2D square times the sine of PQD over PQD square. Yeah? Uh, now, when I convolve this with that, yeah, well, this is very simple. As before, it's just the value of the function there. Yeah? So it's 2D square times the sine PQD over PQD square. So you see, I've added the square root of E. I've added the 2D square here. And then I've added this quantity here. OK. So we are almost down, yeah? Now I may calculate the visibility of the fringes, yeah? So the visibility of the fringes is equal to, we would say, E max minus E min divided by E max plus E min. OK, now what I see here we have, yeah, just in front, yeah, a very big, uh, huge quantity that uh, I may call uh, the constant A, OK? So this is A. Now, if I calculate what is E max, well, it's, of course, uh, this uh, function when cosine is equal to plus 1, yeah? So it will be uh, A times 2 times the free transform of O prime. You agree? So it's uh, A times 2 times the Fourier transform of O prime. Now, minus E min, yeah? But E min, yeah, is uh, this function when the cosine is equal to minus 1, right? Minus 1. Oh. Yes. So here, no. Here I, I, think, uh, I think something is not correct. Huh? So I repeat, huh? so it's, okay, just make this parenthesis smaller, <laughs> like this. So I repeat, E max is A times 1 times 1 plus the Fourier transform of O prime, okay, like this, huh? minus. E min, e min, yeah, is A times 1 minus, because cosine will be minus, yeah, the Fourier transform of O prime, like this, yeah, divided by E max plus E min, yeah, so divided by A times 1 plus the Fourier transform of O prime plus A times 1 minus the Fourier transform of O prime. Okay? 
So it's equal to here I have a minus a, and now here I have a times the Fourier transform of O prime plus a times the Fourier transform of O prime, so twice, divided by a plus a, 2a. So at the end, it's equal to the Fourier transform of O prime yeah, for the baseline D. Yeah. So you see, it, it has been a long calculation, yeah, but we have demonstrated now that for the case of a two aperture with finite size, uh, separated by baseline big D, yeah, uh, the visibility of the fringes that I would observe, yeah, for a symmetric source, yeah, the source that is symmetric, yeah, is just the Fourier transform of the normalized intensity distribution, yeah. If uh, the fringes are maximum, E min is equal to zero, the visibility is equal to one. If the Fourier transform is equal to one, O prime is necessarily the Dirac function. Yeah. So it means that the source has not been resolved. It's a point-like source. Yeah. So it works, yeah? Perfectly well, yeah. Now, well, <coughs> when I see O prime like that, yeah, O prime, which uh, you remember depended on uh, the quantity P, and then I see, oh, here the variable is D, yeah? So, well, for me, uh, it was non-trivial, yeah, to interpret that result, yeah? But to interpret it correctly, yeah, let's do like that, yeah? Let's do as follows, yeah? So, I know that OPDP is equal to a new function, but defined here, it's in terms of an angular angular variable, yeah? X prime over F, yeah? Is an angle, yeah? And dx prime over F. So I find that O prime of P that I have here, yeah? Is equal to this quantity times dx prime over F and divided by dP. Now I know that P, P is equal to X prime over lambda F. So DX prime over DP, DX prime over DP is equal to lambda F. Correct? So here I could write that this is equal to X prime over F time dx prime dp, lambda f over f, so times lambda. Correct? Okay. If this is correct now, let's try to find out yeah, what is the Fourier transform of that quantity. So the Fourier transform of O prime of p for the value d is equal to integration of O prime uh, of X prime over F. O prime of P, I just write, yeah. so it's equal to something like X prime over F, okay, times lambda time exponentiation of minus 2 pi uh, PD uh, yeah it is PD yeah? PD like that but P equal X prime over lambda F yeah so it's X prime over lambda F like this correct now times 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 d well it was times yeah d, dp but it's not dp it should be dr yeah 
Should be DR here, yeah? And a DR, yeah? Is also equal to dx prime over lambda f, yeah? So dx prime over lambda f. Now, <coughs> let's wait. So here I have x prime over f, here I have x prime over f, here I have x prime over f, yeah? And this lambda goes away with that one, yeah? So what remains is a double integration of this quantity. Now, x prime over f, yeah, I could call it zeta, okay? So it would be all zeta, exponential solution of this times zeta times d over lambda, and then d zeta. And this I find that it's a Fourier transform, yeah? of the angular normalized distribution of the source, yeah? For the value of the parameter d over lambda. Like this, okay? In particular, yeah, if uh, the source, yeah, is circular, yeah, circular, yeah, you remember? If it's circular, we have seen last time that the Fourier transform, yeah, of uh, this quantity d over lambda is equal to it was two times the first order Bessel function yeah to pi times theta of the uniform disk yeah, times d over lambda divided by p theta uniform disk times d over lambda oh, it's d over lambda or lambda over d so it's a, it's d over lambda? I had written here before, yeah, the result, yeah, I just, it's correct? Yeah, okay. So you see, okay, th this is for the experiment, yeah, that uh, I will propose you to perform, yeah? So what we will do, we'll take a flashlight, flashlight, yeah, Well, with a certain size, yeah? So I could say, okay, just for, for... I assume that the diameter, yeah, of the source size is about two millimeter, yeah? Two millimeter is equal to the diameter, okay? Uh, so, diameter. Or I could say diameter like that. Linear diameter, yeah? Then the idea is that we will install at about 15 meters. Maybe it will be 20, 25, 30, I don't know yet, maybe 10, yeah? A photographic camera. Here. And well, on top of it, yeah? Just on top of the objective here, yeah? here. <coughs> we will install a small uh, interferometer. So milli interferometer. I would like to ask you now, yeah, could you tell me what should be the separation between the two holes so that when I will observe yeah, the star, distant star, I will see fringes with a zero visibility. Zero visibility. I already gave some numbers yeah, to a mechanician yeah, to construct such a mask, and I would like you to, to make the calculation. Yeah? So I give you five minutes of time. Yeah. Yeah. But we need to know lambda. Okay, good question. So, very good question. So lambda, we will assume, yeah, is 5,500, I'm sure. So visible, yeah? In principle, you know, with the photographic camera that Olivier Wertz will bring, yeah? When you make a picture, you get a three-color picture, yeah? So you get a red, green, blue, subframes, yeah? That you may treat separately, so you will get three wavelengths, three different wavelengths, yeah? But just well, 
we may assume here that we take uh, a central wavelength in the visible, 5,500 angstrom here. So now I would like to know what should be the separation between my two holes. And uh, I assume that the holes here, yeah, where we we'll have, uh, they will have uh, the size of a half a millimeter here. Yeah? So it will be very small. But this doesn't uh, get into the problem here. Yeah? What is important is the separation. When this argument x is equal to 3.9, yeah? 3.9, about 3.9, uh, you get a zero, zero value for the Bessel, first order Bessel function. So x is equal to 3.9, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wait, wait, you, what, what did you say, 3.9 uh, times? 3.9 times uh, 5,500 angstroms divided by uh, 5 times uh, 2 millimeters over uh, 15,000 uh, no, 15, millimeters. So uh, at the end, I get something like uh, 16 over 3, so 5.3. 5.3 3 what? Millimeters. 5.3 millimeters. OK. Who would like to give another answer? Wait, what, what's your first name? Just remind me. Marco? Martin. 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 How much? Uh, I have uh, 1 centimeter 0.024. One centimeter point. Point twenty-four. Point twenty-four. Uh, point. Point twenty-four. Uh, the fifteen meters must be uh, on the numerator. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, for, for the fifteen meter should be there. Okay. Yes. No problem. Because the angle is uh, no. two millimeters divided by fifteen meters. Well, I was I was just writing what I was hearing. <laughs> yeah. Marie, do you have a, a number? No. no. Do you have a, a number? No. Number? Claire? Here on the right side, engineers? No? Not the, not the exact number, but the same as Leo. Yeah, but same as Leo is suspicious. <laughs> no, I did only uh, an approximation. Yeah. Uh, four millimeters? Four millimeters? So, uh, Bikram? Four millimeters, yeah? Yeah. Michel, do you have one? No. No. Uh, I didn't do the exact calculation, but uh, on the order of one centimeter. So it's Manu, huh? no? Yes. Manu, one centimeter. Okay, so now let, let's make it together. Yeah. So here, you agree, yeah? We may write that pi. Uh, pi. Uh, pi times the d angular diameter of the uniform disk yeah? mm -hmm. times d over lambda is equal to 3.9. Yeah? Yeah? Now well, I divide by pi, 3.9, and it's, it's 1.22. I had one from the tree because I... It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you agree that we find that D is equal to 1.22 times lambda. Yeah. Lambda, well, in micron. Yeah. I, I like the micron. Yeah. 0 0.55. 0 0.55. Yeah. Uh, divided by theta. It means divided by 2. And now, uh, 15 meters in millimeters, yeah, thousand. right? Excuse me? So it's 15,000, yeah? Yes. So times 15 and times 10 to the power 3, yeah? OK. Uh, and this will be in microns. Uh, no, no, this is in microns, yeah? So who, who has got a calculator, yeah? Can you make this? 1.22? times 0 0.55 times 15 divided by 2 times 1,000. Then you may now divide it by 1,002. So don't make it. Then I get it in millimeter. So how much is that?
And the winner is uh, is someone calculating? Yes. Yes. Five point oh three. So Leo is a yeah. But so so Leo is a winner. Bikram uh, second second class second position yeah. Well, after Marta, one point zero twenty four yeah. In Manu, huh? one centimeter. Yeah. I didn't have a calculator, so I don't have anything. I didn't have a calculator. He, he didn't have a calculator either, yeah? So, bad, bad excuse. <laughs> yes. For the angles, shouldn't we take one millimeter? For the what? The, the angle instead of two millimeters. No, because it's angular diameter. So, this is angular diameter, yeah? So it means it's two millimeter divided by by the distance here. Yeah. Okay. So we know that uh, about the size yeah, that we expect between uh, the holes yeah, drilled into the it will be in, in aluminium aluminium plate yeah. So probably it will be something like well the size. I will try to get it very small, something like 0.3 millimeter. Then you agree that if three millimeters resolve it, yeah, 0.3 millimeter cannot resolve it, yeah. So it, it's a good match, yeah. So we will try to get something like that. Yeah. Now, well, I just summarize, yeah, some important results to prepare for the practical work, yeah. So when observing with a single square aperture, yeah. Well, we found yeah, that if we were not resolving the star, yeah, this was a response function. Yeah? So we assume that we don't resolve the, st the star. So this is, so I made right here that it's a, if d, yeah, d, small d, is the size of the square, so it's like this. So this is long P, now long Q. And now, well, if E yeah, is a total flux yeah, of the pond like star, yeah, because I don't resolve it, this is the expression yeah, I should find. Now, well, I'm crazy. I just uh, erased here below, but it's okay. Now, if we observe yeah, with uh, an interferometer made of a two square aperture with a separation big D, this is the expression that we would find. Yeah? So just look. Here I have a square root of E, square root of E. It will give me here. And then I have these two signs. So sign P Q D over P Q D square times the sign P Q D. So here it was P. P Q D P Q D square. Here I had a factor four, yeah. So I can write square times square, and then I have four divided by two, yeah. So it's times two. In here, I had one plus cosine p pi d times the Fourier transform of to say O prime, and then I may write. Uh, well, zeta in here, d over lambda. So this was what <coughs> we got. So now let's assume yeah, that uh, when making uh, the laboratory experiment, yeah, so we use, uh, well, they will not be square, but 
Same will be circular, which is about the same. And do you agree that if we just make the observation with one hole, yeah, with one hole, what we will find yeah, is a airy disk. So just a transport function. So we we'll take a photograph. So we get this image, yeah, which is in fact uh, this response, yeah. Now, if I block the other hole, yeah, make a same picture, I get something very similar at about the same location, yeah, on the camera, yeah. Well, in the perfect world, world yeah, the two images with the same exposure time will be quite exactly the same, yeah. Then no problem. But be aware that maybe the two holes are not exactly the same, yeah. And so we will have to make uh, some combination, yeah, of the information. So this is already something you have to think over, yeah, to prepare the lab, yeah, okay? How to deal with that difficulty. Let's assume it's the same. So, okay, we get this, yeah? After, well, I make this observation, yeah? So we observe uh, there a very distant stellar source, yeah? With a diameter, yeah, that we know, yeah? Two millimeter, for instance, yeah? What do I obtain? Well, of course, yeah? You agree that we obtain uh, something very similar, yeah? Well, all, all of this is similar, yeah? And then we have a modulation, yeah? Modulation by this, yeah? So we get fringes here, yeah? We know we get fringes. And well, I should try, yeah, to get um, such a separation or small holes so that maybe we could get 10 fringes over the airy disk, yeah? Now, in the past, yeah, when the students were performing yeah, this uh, practical work, yeah, they tried to measure visibility here, yeah? So what they were doing, yeah? They were just making a cross-section, something like that, yeah? Or, or let's say putting all the information, yeah, in one dimension. Then they were showing uh, the modulated point spread function, and then they were trying to measure the visibility. This is maximum, this is a minimum. Yeah, okay? And very difficult, yeah, for me, yeah? And well, I never uh, was very satisfied, yeah, with this method, yeah? Okay. Now, do you agree what we can do, yeah? We can divide this one by that one. Yeah, so you take two frames, yeah? So, one small. So this is uh, the one with the two holes. So we get the fringes. And if I divide this intensity, so intensity square square, by the intensity square, what I find is that, well, it's equal to two times one plus the cosine of p pi d. Times the Fourier transform, yeah, of O prime, yeah. So this is just one dimensional information, you agree? Just one dimensional, yeah? So dividing this one by that one, yeah, allows you to get rid from the hairy disk, yeah, which is annoying and just get the information, yeah, yeah, corresponding to the contrast of the fringes, yeah. So it should be, this should be very easy to measure, yeah. So from, once you do that, I think, yeah, then, uh, then you derive uh, what is this value. And if you find, for instance, that uh, this is equal to zero, yeah? It could be, yeah? That is equal to zero, you see no fringes, yeah? It means then that the angular diameter of the source, yeah, is equal to 1.22 lambda over d, yeah? Where d is the baseline, the separation between the two holes, yeah? Lambda is the wavelength, and that's all, yeah? So, you, you see, this is probably 
something more, inter more interesting approach than what was made in the past of collapsing yeah, the, all the information in 1D and getting a very strange signal and extracting the visibility. Yeah. Here in principle, of course, you, as I said, maybe the two holes will not be equally the same. Now I hope that the exposure times yeah, will be the same yeah, for the two exposure. Maybe that it will be a long exposure. So if we expose during 15 seconds, yeah, then even if we make a small mistake of one tenth of a second, it will not be of importance. Yeah? So one will have to adjust experiment yeah, so that we know we get something uh, which is equal to that function. Okay? Now, wh what one should also do yeah, is first take one exposure like that, take one exposure like that, take one exposure like that, and after take one exposure like that. Because maybe during 15 seconds, you get some background on the photograph, yeah? which would be the dark. Yeah? And then we should subtract the dark yeah, from both exposures yeah? before making the division. So I'm very curious yeah, to see uh, if it's going to work or not. Yeah? Now, another possibility yeah, to make the experiment is the following. Yeah? improvisation here, but we know that when we observe yeah, EPQ in the focal plane, so this, this is equal to OPQ convolved yeah, with the response function of the interferometer. And from this relation we've seen last time yeah, that we may extract OPQ OPQ which would be equal to the inverse Fourier transform yeah, of so the Fourier transform of E P Q divided by the Fourier transform of H P Q square. You agree? So now experimentally, yeah, how one would proceed? Yeah? Well, just experimentally, yeah? you would take uh, one frame of a distant source, yeah? so with a finite source disk, yeah? with the two holes, yeah? and you get this information. Yeah? If you get that information, you may calculate the Fourier transform. Yeah? Yeah? This would be part of the practical work, yeah, to find a good tool yeah, to calculate numerically yeah, Fourier transform. Yeah. How would you proceed to get that one? Well, experimentally. Yeah. Suppose we don't resolve something. Yeah, so how do you do? Uh, one inverse, very infinite. Exactly, yeah. So you go in the same corridor, yeah? then let's assume that here you are observing at a distance of 15 meters, yeah? Well, you would take yeah, this tiny lamp yeah, and go uh, at 45 meters maybe, or even farther away, yeah? So very, very far away. Or even a smaller size uh, source of light, yeah? So that you would get yeah, the response, well, the free transform of the response function of your interferometer, yeah? So this is exactly uh, given by this one. By this one, if the Fourier transform is equal to one, yeah? So if this is equal to one, yeah? <coughs> this is exactly what you would obtain yeah, for the intensity. But experimentally, yeah, you could uh, observe it, yeah? observe the fringes, take the Fourier transform, so then you get that information. You take the ratio, you take the inverse Fourier transform, yeah? and then yeah, you should probably retrieve yeah, along two coordinates yeah, uh, the intensity distribution of the source. Yeah? OK, now to, to retrieve it, yeah, you would have to use maybe different baselines yeah? Yeah, and change their orientation. Well, it, it can be a lot of fun. Yeah? Nice, very nice uh, 
practical work yeah, to, to, to try. Yeah. Okay, now another thing I will show you is that it's possible yeah, to retrieve yeah, this information yeah, analytically. Analytically, yeah. Well, I will show you in a moment how. Yeah. So it's a theorem yeah, of, of a Wiener vin, uh, chicken, which says that this is equal yeah, to the autocorrelation function of your interferometer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's something very simple. So this will be a demonstration uh, in a few seconds. Yeah, but before uh, going to another demonstration, I wanted to ask you, so do you have questions about uh, this laboratory experiment? Yeah? So before the end of the lecture, you tell me yeah, when you're available during the next week, eventually, or the week after, two, three hours. Yeah? So you may uh, carry out carry on, you know, the, the experiment. So once we can make it, uh, one group will make it with a uniform stellar source, yeah? The other group will make uh, with a double star, yeah? And uh, there is, a, you, you see, there is a lot of uh, possibilities, yeah, to, to, to experiment here, yeah? And to say, but we may, encounter difficulties, maybe even impossible to, to, make, to make it, yeah? But then you, you should uh, describe why it was difficult, why it was impossible. So I don't care about the results, yeah? But I really care about, uh, let's say, the methodology yeah? that you will follow. One is to make the interference in the focal plane as we do now, yeah? yeah? So you see uh, the two light beams, yeah? Coming through a converging system. And then what we observe yeah, in the focal plane, there are just fringes like this, of course. Yeah? And uh, as I said just at, at the end, yeah, the fringes encoded, well, no, in the focus image, the transverse coordinates or this coordinate measures the delay between the beams. Yeah? So here we have no delays, we have half a wavelength, one wavelength, half, one more half a wavelength, and so on. Yeah? Okay? But there is another way to combine the beam, I didn't mention, but just for your curiosity, yeah, is to do the following. You may mix the signals yeah, by superposing uh, collimated beams. Yeah? So just uh, seeing in terms of uh, two parallel beams of light coming from two different telescopes, yeah? you let them uh, come on uh, So this is... Uh, will semi-reflecting mirrors, yeah? So one beam goes there, the other one also. So part of this beam goes there, the other one reflects. Part of that beam goes there. So here, the two parallel beams are mixed up, yeah? And then, of course, yeah, you put here a converging system somewhere, and then on a single pixel detector, you measure the flux. And what you do, you, you try to change the delay between the two beams, yeah? And uh, where well, this is a modulation as a function of time of the de delay between the two beams, and what you see on the detector is just these packages of fringes, just uh, interf interference, yeah? Being shown as a variation of the intensity, yeah? So for a given, uh, value you see of the delay, well, okay, you get a maximum. When you increase the delay, alpha wavelength, it goes to almost to zero, yeah? But it doesn't go to zero, it goes to a, to a minimum, yeah? And from that, you may measure visibility, yeah? So some people are operating, yeah, interferometers in that way, yeah? But just for your information. Okay, now comes uh, the wiener kinchin theorem, yeah? which states yeah, that, you remember, we are interested in finding an an, well, analytical solution yeah, for that uh, Fourier transform. Yeah? So the theorem states that the Fourier transform yeah, of the response function is a focal plane, yeah, is just the autocorrelation function of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane. Yeah? Now, well, in, in, in practice, what does it mean? Yeah? We'll just show you on a, one example here. Let's assume that 
Well, I'm interested in finding this. Yeah? Well, wh what I could do, I could, in principle, take the Fourier transform of this when this is equal to 1. Yeah? Okay? You can try to take the Fourier transform and maybe you'll find a simple analytical solution. Probably yes. Yeah? Probably yes. But the approach I'm going to show you yeah, is uh, more straightforward. Yeah? So we are going to calculate directly this. For instance, yeah, that here is a x direction, here is a y direction. And that I'm using a meter for meter with two circular apertures like this. Yeah? So the theorem says that where is the Fourier transform yeah, of, the, of this response function, which is uh, the Fourier transform of that, yeah, when uh, this is equal to 1, is equal simply to the autocorrelation of the pupil function. Yeah? And this is very easy to calculate. Yeah? So what I do here, I just represent here the autocorrelation function. So here, I assume that the distance between the two mirrors yeah, is uh, B. And I assume that the diameter yeah, of one of those mirrors constituting my inframeter yeah, is A. Well, then the autocorrelation function yeah, will look something like that. Yeah? You tell me if you agree. Well, I just leave this uh, in the pupil plane, and now I translate. Yeah? So I may translate it in different ways. I may put this one here on top, but the, then the, the other one here will come here. Yeah? Then the other is to put this one on top of that one. So this one will come here. And this one will come here, like that. Correct? So, I mean, if this is, uh, so here the, 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 the distribution of the complex amplitude is real, huh? yeah, okay? It's one or zero. Huh? So I can say, okay, this is P star of xy that I have represented here. And now for different values of small a and small b, which is not this a and b, yeah? okay? I take all possible values of a and b. Yeah? Well, I say, okay, when uh, this one will come here, I will have uh, some, uh, some response. Uh, when, uh, this one, this one will come here and we will have some response. So, I don't know how to, first I represent the, the correlation in one dimension, otherwise it will be too difficult. Yeah? So, what I say here, okay, I say that in zero, zero, I will have a perfect overlap of that one over that one. So for A equals 0, B equals 0, yeah, there is a perfect overlap. Yeah? So here I would say, OK, uh, I will get something like that with a triangular function. Yeah? Here, when this one will come here, I will have a triangular function too. When the other one, uh, this one gets here. I see a contribution, so this will be a double, double peak. And when finally, yeah, this one will get here. I will get. So this is a kind of autocorrelation function yeah, of these two pupil functions represented. Yeah? Now, this is one dimensional. Yeah? If I represent this in two dimensions, I would get something like that. Yeah? 
some goals. Do you agree with that or not? Do you see it or not? No. Okay, so first I shall make the demonstration and after we come back here to the visualization. <coughs> 